Welcome to Strip Coverlet, I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for part two of a nine-part series as we travel through uh, White Knights by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is a discussion, a discussion on the second night that is uh, when our protagonist and the young woman are reacquainting themselves uh, and getting to know each other a little bit more. Again, uh, the literary nature of this piece starts right off the bat as on the first page we have a quote uh, which will be important, I believe. From the young woman, I know, I know, but now to the matter at hand, do you know why I've come? Not to talk nonsense like yesterday, you know. Here's why. We need to act more sensibly from now on. I thought about this, I thought about all this for a long time last night. This means trouble. Uh, this young woman has no real connection to our protagonist, and she is reaching to control the tone of their meetings. Anyone who does that is uh, probably unstable, and if you know someone or meet someone who is trying to do these things, it's probably best to walk away. Um, further, they end up talking for a little while about nonsense. So, uh, this is this is something that is that Dostoevsky is, is very good at doing is presenting a very realistic type of, of conversation. So we go from this icebreaker where we're not going to talk about nonsense to a little bit of nonsense. Further on page twenty, uh, we get the quote. Oh no, of course. I see people, but nevertheless, I am alone. What a brilliant and writerly quote. Who among us has not gone out to be alone among people? Who among us has not gone out to be alone among people? This is not a normal thing, you know. Most people do not do this. Stand outside a showing for the latest Fast and the Furious movie. And when the people come out of this vapid film, ask 100 of the audience members what it means to be alone with people. 90 of them will have no idea what you mean. Eight of them will understand. Two of them will, have, will be so confused they don't know how to respond. And three of them will not be able to add correctly. And what, what that would go to show is to say that, hey, no one really does that, but, but people who do that. It is a very select thing for people to go out and be alone among people. And you can always recognize someone who is doing this. And you can always recognize someone who is doing this but is not comfortable doing so. Uh, moving on, we have a quote from the same page spilling on to the kissing page, 20 and 21. This again from the young woman. Uh, so who are you then? Explain yourself. Wait, I'll hazard a guess. You probably have a grandmother like I do. She's blind and for as long as I can remember she has never let me go anywhere so that I've practically forgotten how to talk. A couple of years ago I got into a lot of mischief and she saw that she couldn't control me so she called me over and pinned my dress to hers with a safety pin. And ever since we sit like that for days on end, she knits a stocking, and even though she's blind, even though she's blind, and I sit beside her sewing or reading a book to her out loud. It's such a strange way to live, and I've been pinned to her like that for two years already. This is another problematic quote. First off, uh, this is projection, much in the same way that w our protagonist projected on characters in the first chapter, uh, projected his own life experiences onto other people. You have a grandmother like I do, don't you, who has done this to you. What a, what a very strange and, and unique way to project. Um, first and second off, for as long as I can remember, she's never let me go anywhere. For as long as I can remember, she's never let me go anywhere. That is connected after one period to the phrase, a couple of years ago I got into a lot of mischief. 
which we then go into this cockamamie story about being safety pinned to someone. So this is obviously an unstable character as well. Uh, but later on page 21, we get the quote, listen, do you know what a dreamer is? What a quote, what a quote. But again, this is Dostoevsky returning to the subliminal nature of literature. Say the quote again. Listen, do you know what a dreamer is? Now this quote is happening in a conversation between our two characters, but I defy you to even lie to me and say that when you hear the quote, listen, do you know what a dreamer is? That you don't automatically for yourself respond to this prompt. That you do not automatically for yourself implant what a dreamer is. And who is not in love with the idea of, of being a dreamer? Uh, especially people who are readers. People who are readers are definitely in love with the idea of being a dreamer. So to put that in there is to automatically engage your reader on a deeper level, which is something very slick. On the next page, we learn the young woman's name. And it is Naz Tinka, Naz Tinka, Naz Tinka, Naz Tinka. Feels real good to say. On 23, we get this quote. There are, Nestinka, in case you don't know, there are rather strange little corners in Petersburg. It's as if the sun that shines for all of Petersburg doesn't even peek into these places. But there is another different sun, as if specially ordered for these corners. And it shines on everything with a different special light. In these corners, dear Nastinka, it's as if a completely different kind of life is lived. One that doesn't resemble that which sees around us, but the kind that might exist in a faraway kingdom and not among us in our serious, oh so serious times. And it is this life which is a mixture of something purely fantastic, fervently ideal, and at the same time, alas, Nestinka, Dully prosaic and ordinary, not to say incredibly vulgar. And what strikes me about this quote is that she began with a little bit of trying to make the two of them one, right? You probably have a grandmother like I do. Uh, and his, his, the beginning of his story is so distant and so stop you don't know me um but why why is his story in the beginning of his story especially so cryptic she is forced to be a dreamer by the fact that she is being uh withheld from someone at least that's how it seems at this time her cockamamie stories is thin but i'm assuming that she is being restrained at some level anyway uh, and he feels that there is no alternative. She is someone who is longing for company. He is someone who longs uh, to be alone. And finally, the rest of his story is basically 10 pages and four sentences in one paragraph. It's ridiculous, it's laborious. Uh, there is hardly a period and area paragraph break, but it tells us something about the purpose, the person who is delivering this story. This story is 100% memorized and rehearsed. Um, and the fact that it is so long and it is so calm, it is so brick-like, might that mean that it is in fact rapid and uninterruptible? As we said in our last video, the first installment of this nine part series. Um, and finally, for me in this chapter, we get this quote from 35, where he's given his story and explained what he's done. And she says, listen, you do know that it's bad for you to live like that. And he replies, I know, Nestinka, I know. 
I exclaimed, no longer holding my feelings in check. And now, I know more than ever that I've wasted all my best years for nothing. Basically, the vibe I'm getting off of this guy uh, is this is a bipolar writer who doesn't publish. Damn you, Dusty Dosty, for throwing me under the bus like that. But that's fine. That's fine. I can handle it. You know, you're going to go ahead and put my story out there like that. Now, the feeling I got when, 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 when I read that little quote after his convoluted story is sort of like the feeling that you get when you maybe did some drinking the night before and you wake up and you've got nine notifications on Facebook and the first thing that runs from your through your mind is <laughs> what did I do and then you get this deep guttural this deep guttural phrase it's gonna be alright it's gonna be alright I'm gonna get through this right uh, something utterly embarrassing uh, you know is out there uh, and it's very relatable in this in this chapter this this long rambling rant that he's gone on that I think there are several parts in this that you have to relate to um, and it's someone who's just bearing their soul like that I hate to use a cliche like bearing a soul but putting things out there on the line and it's sort of uh, it's sort of like what Tom Spanbauer does in, in, in his writing this uh, dangerous writing when you say things that are so out there and so personal and the first thing that you think is oh my god putting this on paper someone is going to judge me uh, but what ends up happening is that your your reader reads it and thinks I've been there and I have never known to put there in these words. Uh, so I will also be looking for that as we go through this. And that's all I've got for the second chapter and second installment in this nine part series. If you like this sort of thing, be sure to leave me a like and uh, maybe throw some questions around in the comment section or suggest things that I may have missed in this because there, there that really was a big block of uh, dialogue there that I, I'm sure I missed something important in. Um, but I would hope to see you next time in this series, which is Naz Tinka's story. I am guessing we're getting uh, a bit from her uh, moving forward. So again, hit that like and subscribe button, and I hope to see you next time.